Uh, so, first of all, I want to welcome everybody here today on behalf of the School of Policy Planning and Development and the University of Southern California. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jen Giuliano. I'm a Senior Associate Dean for Research and Technology uh, in SPPD. Uh, and in that role, I provide oversight for SPPD's 12 research centers, uh, including this one, as well as our portfolio of funded research. Uh, I'm really delighted to welcome all of you to this event today. Um, it's been organized and presented by the uh, USC Center for Sustainable Cities. Uh, just a few words about CSC, as we call it. Um, CSC has actually been at USC for on the order of 10 years, uh, but it's a new arrival in the School of Policy Planning and Development. We have a brochure in your folder here, which gives you a little bit of description in terms of what the Center for Sustainable Cities is uh, and what it's intended to do. We're very pleased to have excuse me, CSC and SPPD. Uh, as far as we're concerned, what better place for interdisciplinary research uh, on making our metropolitan areas more sustainable than a school that includes urban planning, public policy, and real estate development, and public management. So we feel the fit here um, is better uh, than, it, than it was uh, or could have been anywhere else. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have persuaded Hilda Blanco, who is sitting right there, uh, to serve as our interim director of the Center for Sustainable Cities. Um, Hilda is from the University of Washington. Uh, she's a former department chair of an urban planning department. She's had a very distinguished career in urban planning. Um, and she is one of uh, the planning colleagues of ours who actually has been conducting research on climate change for quite some time in terms of the planning aspects of mitigating climate change and adapting to climate change. Um, in your brochure, you will see that the Center for Sustainable Cities has two thematic areas. One of them is cities and global climate change, which is what you're going to hear about today. Uh, and the other is in sustainable policies and governance. Um, probably I don't have to tell anyone here that cities are significant generators of greenhouse gas emissions, and they will also be significantly affected by climate change. They, and then finally, they will play a key role in any sort of mitigation of greenhouse gas reductions that we manage in the future. Today we're going to hear about the global climate change impacts in California and what we might do about it. Um, I've had the pleasure um, to serve on a panel at the National Academy of Sciences on America's climate challenges. Uh, and in that, on, while I was doing that work, one of my real educations was to sit around with climate scientists and hear what they had to say about climate change. Um, and I have to tell you that you don't have to sit in too many of those meetings and see too many of their charts uh, before you realize that this is really a big deal. Um, the scientists have done an excellent job, I think, of demonstrating that global change is happening and that it's going to continue to happen through this century all matter, almost no matter what we do. Um, so even if we were to turn off the CO2 spigot today, um, the climate would continue to change for at least the next 50 years. Uh, so that gets us to climate change adaptation. Uh, the only question we have before us really uh, is how much change is going to take place and what's the time frame of that change. So I can't think of anything more important really than, than having a gathering like today. Uh, we've got an excellent panel who's going to discuss uh, the California Adaptation, uh, if I've got this right, Advisory Panel's findings and recommendations on how California might prepare for uh, climate change impacts as we understand them at the micro level of a state of California. Uh, we're going to start with Dan Masmanian, uh, who will provide an overview of the panel's findings and recommendations. Dan is a colleague of mine. He's the Bedrosian uh, Chair in Governance, and he's the director of our Bedrosian Center on Governance and the Public Enterprise. He served as co-director of this advisory panel. 
Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, talking about all the wonderful qualifications of Dan and everybody else here. Uh, because in your um, brochure, you also have a series of bios of all the speakers that you're going to hear from today. So that's where you should go for the details to find out how really famous all these people are. Um, before I turn over to Dan, uh, I just want to thank our sponsors for this event. Um, we are primarily funded by a very generous grant from HSBC Bank Foundation. Um, and we are funded in part by SPPD. Uh, so without uh, that generous funding, we wouldn't be able to do things like that. And I really want uh, everyone to know how much we appreciate the support we've received so far. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. He's going to do his presentation. And we've decided that uh, it'll probably work better. <laughs> okay. It'll probably work better if we hold questions to the end. So once again, welcome, and let's get going. Thank you. Um, well, well, let me begin. I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenge, the task force, the guiding principles behind the task force, and then our recommendations. We also have some specific threats where we did some fairly detailed analysis, and I'll explain that, and there's write-ups. Not in the executive summary, which, which you have, but in the full report, which is online. It was on that first, um, it was on that, uh, that first uh, slide, and it's on the back, I believe, of the executive summary. It's at the Pacific Council, and I'll explain why that's the case also in just a minute. Uh, but the challenge is, is the projected global temperature increases. And this is really the story behind the IPCC report, the concern around the world about climate change and the possible consequences. And what we have here is the projected maps of, of temperature increases in our state from 1960s through the end of this century. And while you can't see all the details, you can see it gets redder and redder, as in warmer and warmer, at least based on today's projected models. So why the task force? Well, the task force was established in the spring of 2009 in, in uh, view of the need to develop state policies, as was perceived by a, a number of the members of the Pacific Council of International Policy, which is a non-for-profit association here in Los Angeles, but really bringing together people from across the West Coast, talk, thinking typically about issues of our normal international relations. But the members of the Pacific Council concluded that climate change is relevant globally, but also California has been at least a policy leader in a number of environmental areas. And this is one they thought they would invest in in terms of an assessment of the challenges to California, the possible policy options as a model possibly for where others will be moving. To put this in context, by the way, if we go back to the summer of 2009, there was enormous hope that COP15 in Copenhagen would develop a mitigation strategy worldwide, and then the next issue on the agenda would be adaptation. But as you heard from Jen, and as we all know, COP15 did not develop the global international accord on mitigation, but that hasn't changed with the need to think about adaptation. So the considerations of the task force began with the, the, the science of climate change. Uh, what, what, is, what is there we need to know? Uh, it looked at the political and public policy context in California, AB 32, the recession we're facing. Uh, and prior to the um, creation of the task force, there had already been underway a group in the state, uh, at state level under the resources agency, bringing agency leaders together to think about what they could be doing in terms of the adaptation strategy. And that report is out. It's the state's adaptation strategy. It was released in 2009 by the governor. The, the audience intended was policy opinion leaders, the public elected leaders. So who's on this task force? Well, two of them are sitting here. They'll be on the panel. But the three co-chairs are, are uh, Bill Riley, Mason Wilrich, Patrick Lavin, representing environment, energy, and labor. Uh, the names you may recognize some, if not all, are policy and opinion leaders throughout the state. But they weren't drawn from uh, sitting elected officials. They were drawn from different constituencies and interests with the aspiration of seeing if this group 
could find a common ground in both appreciating the science and then developing some steps forward for the state in this area. The guiding principles, one of the first things the task force did when it came together was think through and talk about, well, what are, what are the key issues of concern to us that in fact should guide our deliberations and recommendations? Science-based policy, number one, number two, number three, science-based policy, especially in the context of thinking about, we'll call it this, skepticism about science, the, the uh, reticence of some to embrace the notion that not only is the climate changing, but it's doing so at an accelerating rate, the, the methods of science. So we thought we really had to, to base everything under the assumption that the science, although evolving, is where we want to turn for cues as to where the climate will be moving throughout our century. Cost-effective actions. Very important also, uh, based on that science, which is making decisions that hopefully are no regrets in the long-term investment choices all, are going to be made that are in some sense win-win. That was talked about as a financial consideration and also with respect to mitigation and adaptation. Uh, aligning incentives. Uh, a great deal of discussion, not only among the task force, but among everybody in society, or how are we going to pay for what we want from the public sector in the future? How are we going to assess charges and costs to one another? And while we did not come up with some specifics, the fundamental principle was find ways that people will invest in their own best interest that communities will invest in things that serve them in the long run. And the really important issue here is in the long run. But finding those strategies and tools is, is an aspiration of the group. Also, a uh, sense of enormous public engagement on this issue is needed. We're not the first to say that, but that became one of the principles. And then the coordination of planning and decision making, which may seem self-evident, especially to everybody in this room. It's just in the real world, it doesn't always occur. So we want to underscore that. Uh, the approach, the task force thought answers to, to three critical issues, which is what are the key challenges, what are the options for addressing them, and what are the gaps in planning and policy at the local, regional, state level in dealing with adaptation. And by the way, these issues uh, 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 required a fair amount of conversation from people representing a whole vast array of interests from the environment to business to local planning uh, we actually uh, called upon specialists in the, uh, in the science focusing on sea level rise, focusing on forest fire, focusing on water supply to inform us. It was not part of the task force ambition to develop additional science or to complement the ongoing climate science, but to take the state of the art today, inform ourselves about it, and then ask the questions, what are the threats, what are the possible impacts, and what do we recommend be done about them? So, so the group chose three areas, partly because we had limited time and could not take on all those that are obvious, the health vectors, other concerns, but these three, partly because the science was more developed here than elsewhere, and partly because these impacts are going to have enormous effect and visibly so on California. So, so one of these, deci this decision was made in part to, to make it vivid, if you will, to real for Californians as we think about this. Sea level rise, well, based on the global climate change temperatures of a two to four degree predicted uh, by the IPCC, uh, you can't see it quite as well, but this is the San Francisco Bay and this is the San Francisco Bay area as you'll see, this is the southern part of the bay. This would be inundated under these models by the end of the century in terms of sea level rise. And you can't quite see it well, but these dark blue areas similarly along the shoreline of San Francisco. And we, we called upon this. This was one of the presentations that the group was given by BCDC because in the Bay Area Conservation Development Commission, they've actually developed some pretty sophisticated mappings of different scenarios that would affect the Bay Area. Uh, in these areas. So this gives you an idea of the kind of thing. The one on, on, uh, on uh, your left showing Oakland Airport, of course Oakland Airport would be underwater if something doesn't change and the sea level does rise. 
Uh, sea level rise populations at risk. The Pacific Institute provided us some of the information on this, the background science, and as it did so for the uh, for this resources strategy. You can see here that the sea level rise population at risk is quite significant, not only in the Bay Area, which is, which is obvious by the number of dots and the size, but also down here in Orange County, uh, second most impacted area from a sea level rise in terms of human habitation and costs uh, reflected in the property at risk in these two areas. Water, well, the snowpack in the High Sierra which uh, for which we rely on up to, we're told, 40 percent of the storage capacity of the state's uh, water uses uh, will be reduced by up to 80 percent. Well, what is the implications? And you can see across this, uh, this is the High Sierra snowpack uh, receding. The argument was precipitation may not change, but how we receive it in terms of snow versus rain will, which will have a dramatic impact. And of course, we had a whole group focusing on the water. Uh, Ron Gaslam, you'll hear in a moment, was on that panel. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A, I hope. But we said, well, this is a very serious issue for California. Forest fire and rangeland fires. Uh, these are, uh, this chart was provided by one of our consultants. I'll come to in a moment. But this is looking over time at the uh, most recently increasing uh, costs uh, California is facing in terms of severity and costs of fires. And this, uh, which I hope you can see reasonably well, although there are different scenarios, this was the most dramatic we have in terms of the projections. And this takes us out to 2085, a uh, wildfire scenario. And, and along, along the horizon here is the percentage increase in burned area. And the extreme red is 300 times. 300 percent, rather, I'm saying time 300 percent uh, increase over current burn patterns. So that Northern California, even much more than Southern California, will experience severe forest fires and rangeland fires as a consequence of the projected climate change. Uh, the group simply adopted a, a way of thinking through the process that started with program, uh, pro problem identification, assessment, planning. Uh, and funding and implementation. So we thought about this framework in talking through what we're going to recommend. Um, somewhat simplistic, but very helpful in thinking about what options were. The group adopted the three R's, which is you can think about responses in terms of establishing resilience. Uh, you can think about, and that's in this area, where I think we spent most of our energy as a group imagining uh, resilience. You can think about resistance, which is simply trying to fight off the changes that nature is bringing our way. And you can think about retreat, which is stepping back from where we are on the land and the uses we make of it and places we've occupied as, as uh, in human systems. And uh, you could imagine, you, you, you probably know about sea level uh, uh, sea walls, which are under uh, discussion today in several places up and down California's coastline. If I take you back to the, 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 the diagram of the bay and look at Oakland Airport. Uh, Seawall is a major strategy they're currently developing to protect Oakland's airport uh, and many other places. Um, the resilience, however, uh, was, was more attractive as a positive incremental way for all of us to think about our first order of, of response. So we tried to think of different ways one could deal with sea level rise heat and fire, water supply through resilience strategies. We did so, I think, for two reasons. One, there are a number of such incremental strategies that are imaginable. And two, we're talking about a population of California possibly growing to 60 million people by 2050. How are we going to occupy this state if we don't think about resilience? Uh, retreat. Uh, as you might think about yourself, no one is very excited about the retreat option. If, you, if you're living along the, uh, the coast of California, you could imagine, I'm sure, several places where retreat is not physically possible, but it may be necessary. Uh, in the heat fire area, move out of the fire zone, similar retreat, not very attractive to people who are living in the foothills and in the high Sierra currently and, and want to occupy that. And, and the water supply didn't quite apply in that. But, but this was the framework within which we had our discussions. Primary recommendations. The number one recommendation, the most concrete one, which I hope we have some conversation about today, 
is to establish a Climate Risk Council for California. The, the thinking, and I'll come to in a minute about that, being that we want to go back to this science. Without having a good handle on the science as it evolves and what it really means for the consequences of climate change, we're going to, if you will, if you will be spending an awful lot of time and energy debating possible implications without having some uh, authoritative, legitimate, reliable source of the information. This became most evident to, I think, just about everybody on the, on the task force and possibly you as well when you think about where this is going to play out. This is going to play out on the infrastructure development on the ground. It's going to play out in our cities and our regions. It's, there's not such thing as a state response. There may be a state framework, but the responses are going, to, are going to play out in the thousands of decisions made on the ground. And we don't have good information about the possible implications of climate change at that level. So this was developed that, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, another uh, issue that became quite obvious as we work through these different uh, threats is the, the need to monitor and collect additional data on the resources themselves, as in water districts uses, as in the snowpack melt and what it might imply, as its heat level rises as it moves throughout the state, uh, about sea level uh, measurements uh, at different spots along our state. So we talked about this is really important to do and this is really a public function, we believe about improving the multi-level and cross-sectoral communications of coordination for adaptation planning. Uh, anybody involved in this area will know that this is a very difficult thing to accomplish, nevertheless necessary. And then aligning incentives for proactive adaptation management and developing funds for supporting large-scale community-based projects. Uh, I must say, and you'll see in the report, we, we uh, don't have recommendations in this particular area and we don't because the group collectively could not resolve what to recommend so we recommend further study. Um, that's the reality of dealing with 24 different interests in the state or 24 people representing different interests in the state and not having a definitive path forward. And I'll go back to the beginning. In a state of fiscal difficulty uh, without uh, any public interest, at least a sufficient public interest, in some kind of a taxing strategy. There are other options, but we couldn't, we couldn't agree on what to recommend. And then, um, <clears throat> and then we also recommend that assessments must be undertaken for the important threats not covered by this report. The, the group saw this as a beginning, not an end, to thinking about adaptation strategies. The role of the Climate Risk Council. Uh, I want to touch on that because, as I mentioned, I think it is the most concrete of the recommendations we made, which is to compile, organize, and assess scientific information on accelerating climate change effects on the state, with the emphasis on accelerating. This is not a linear projection forward. This is how do you think about this in a new way. Develop periodically, uh, review and update these risk assessment protocols and guidelines that will be used to making concrete decisions in California. So that this is, in a sense, this risk, uh, uh, the Climate Risk Council's job is not simply to come up with a protocol and walk away, but to be the group responsible for changing, evolving, adapting as the science evolves, as our technologies for adapting evolve, as experiments, real world experiments, are played out in the state and we learn. Um, to conduct a public review, go through this, to advise the public entities and others about this, to be, if you will, a, a centerpiece of the state's go forward strategy in adaptation. Um, a second function uh, seen by this is to develop the protocols for the kind of cost effective analysis that the group believed is going to be necessary uh, to complement the risks in thinking about large scale infrastructure or long term development uh, projects for the state. I'm going through this quickly, but we'll get to the Q&A in just a minute. Um, the governance issues, well, we, t we talked about several of them. Does California need a comprehensive adaptation strategy? Should it be outcome-based? Where should the locus of authorities be, uh, bo authority be? What should be government's role versus that of for-profit, non-profit organizations? You know, to what extent does this need to be comprehensive and required? Um, should land use, zoning, construction regulations be aligned? 
these were conversations that were held throughout the uh, 15 months of the task force deliberations. We had subgroups as well as the full group discussions, and they all touched on these issues continuously. We didn't resolve them all, but I just wanted to share with you they were all addressed. Same with funding issues. Who should pay? How should the cost of that be turned into investments in the 21st century, the win-win strategies? What role should risk-based insurance play? And this was, uh, this was discussed extensively. Um, should a state local disaster fund or set aside or trust fund be established? And to what extent should adaptation funding be predicated on the beneficiary pays principle? Um, huge issues that the state we in the state need to resolve. We did not resolve these issues. We discussed them, we brought them up, we aired them. Uh, then we talked about additional uh, and specific threats. We looked at sea level rise, and I want to come back to this because it's not in the executive summary, but if you go to the full report, which is on the website of the Pacific Council, it's www.pacificcouncil backslash Climate, re, uh, climate change backslash report. It was on the first slide. I think it's on the back of the executive summary because the full report is only available online. <clears throat> uh, freshwater supply, we talked about that at great length. The case studies in there, the groundwater banking in the Central Valley and the droughts in Australia, but came out with several additional recommendations that we need to think about. Uh, and then additional specific threat recommendations for forest and, and rangeland fire. Make resilience is the cornerstone of wildlife management. For those of you who are not familiar with our strategy and CAL FIRE strategy historically and the federal governments, we have put most, most of our funding and our effort in terms of dealing with forest fires uh, uh, into resistance, that is putting out fires not resilience, which requires a very different kind of vegetation management and forest level management. But I must say that at the uh, 11th hour, as we were concluding our study, uh, the, the new CAL FIRE and California uh, uh, timber uh, uh, industries recommendations c came out, and it's mentioned in the report, they said, it's a new day, a new paradigm. Vegetation management must be our first order of act activity in the state of California. Uh, it's going to be a very, very labor-intensive, costly task to move to vegetation management, I assure you. But that's our future. And we had a case study of El Dorado County and how that would look and how that would play out. Uh, Jen, I think I've stayed within the 20 minutes you've asked and open for question and answer. We have slides just to show you, but these are just some of the pictures that are included in the report. We have of uh, inundation, sea level rise, erosion, and so forth. Uh, for managed retreat where it has taken place already in some places along the California coastline, what it looks like. Of course, here's what happens when you have inundation. But these are, these are just a few of the photos I thought I'd bring along. The, the report is full of them. So that's the report. And, and I think, I, I, I don't know if you want to take questions now or we should bring the panel up and yeah, question I everyone. I think we should bring the panel up. And first of all, thank you. Yes, that was quick. I, I'd like to take more time, but. Sure, sure. I was going to bring this up to full scale, but any questions? Yes. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. And uh, my question is that you mentioned earlier that at the state level, uh, it did develop a California the uh, climate change adaptation strategy. Yes. And, and could you mention a little bit in terms of the relationship between this effort and the, uh, the, and the statewide adaptation strategy? Yes. Um, when the Pacific Council began thinking about this issue, the state's adaptation strategy planning was underway at the state agency. There are 12 uh, uh, agencies and departments involved in that. Uh, thing you probably know about that because Caltrans had a major study in, involved in this. And it is compiled in, a, it's on the web, uh, a resources agency web, uh, California Adaptation Strategy. And it's on 280 pages, and it talks about what each of those agencies and departments could do. Their mandate from the governor under an executive order in 2008 was, what should the agencies and departments in the state do in anticipating climate change? So that's their adaptation. And it's a, a lengthy list of many very good suggestions on what to do. 
but it didn't have a focus, it didn't say what the next step would be, and they were under at least the implicit uh, a mandate of at no new costs. So they, you know, that was, it was, and it did not involve the business community, and formally it did not represent a cross-section of California. And I will juxtapose this, by the way, to the mitigation planning going on in a number of states across the United States, which are far more collaborative across the public, private, nonprofit sector. So the, uh, I believe the leadership of the Pacific Council thought this was important enough that as a non-public entity but concerned about the future of California, they wanted to st step in, bring in the stakeholders from across the spectrum and ask what kind of guidance would we provide and recommend to the state. So that in December of 2009, when the state's report was released, they had a recommendation that the governor appoint an advisory panel to the state to continue the assessment. And, our, and we had been in conversation with them, by the way, they had been involved in our study from the beginning in terms of giving advice, information, and so forth. And so the governor embraced the then called Climate Change Adaptation Task Force as the advisory panel to the state of California. So he just basically, through his unilateral declaration, morphed us into the advisory panel to the state. So that's the connection. It worked very smoothly. Um, and, um, and it was, uh, uh, if that's sufficient? Thank you. Yeah. So now I'm going to turn it over to Hilda, sit down and be a, a member, right? Very good. In the back? Yes? All right, very good. Well, good morning. And uh, thank you, Professor Juliana, for uh, our introductions. And uh, Professor Masmanian has provided a great overview of the report that was published on November uh, 22nd. As the director of the Center uh, for Sustainable Cities, uh, we were very eager to hold a forum on this report uh, because it is not a report by the usual suspects. Uh, it's not a report by a government uh, organization or a scientific body, but by a distinguished group of leaders from various sectors uh, across California who typically focus on international affairs. So this is a, re this is a report from serious people uh, with strong representation from business, uh, the business community. And, uh, and we thought without an ax to grind, uh, not particularly partisan on this subject, so that it represents a growing consensus that climate change is real and that we need to prepare for its impacts. We are fortunate today to have two members of the State Advisory Panel, uh, Lee Harrington and Ron Gastelum, to share their views from the standpoint of the organizations that they represent. And altogether, we have a terrific group of panelists representing leadership in public, private, and the nonprofit sectors. We thought it was important to have an opportunity for Southern California leaders to respond to the findings and recommendations of the report since the report was a discrete project of the Pacific Council, and if it has any chance of having its recommendations implemented, it must rely on wide public support. Uh, as moderator of the panel, I am going to first introduce the panelists and then provide initial questions to get a dialogue going. Uh, first, the panelists will get about five minutes each to make brief remarks about the organization they represent and the organization's views or work in general about climate change. Uh, since we're fortunate to have an impressive panel, I will make sure that each panelist gets a chance to respond to the general questions that I pose. Uh, now for the introductions, and they're going to be brief since uh, you all have fuller bios in your packets. First, uh, I'm going in alphabetical order. Uh, Catherine uh, Aguilar uh, Pe Perez is the Executive Director of ULI Los Angeles. She has a diverse background in private real estate development, transportation policy, and urban planning. She has worked as uh, VP of Development for Forest City Development, founded and directed a nonprofit to foster greater participation in transportation and land use issues, and was a deputy to the, to the mayor of Pasadena on these issues. She's currently a pro an adjunct professor at USC uh, with our School of Public Policy, uh, of Policy Planning and, Deve and Development. Uh, I forget the acronym sometimes. 
So uh, uh, Ron Gastelum has a law degree from UCLA, and he has focused on environmental municipal law uh, with a particular emphasis on water, waste management, and energy. He served as uh, CEO of the Metropolitan Water District, and upon his retirement from the district in 2004, he helped form a new Southern California renewable energy supply company. He has been executive vice president of the LA Area Chamber of Commerce and is currently the vice chair for public policy on the board of the chamber. Lee Harrington is executive director of the Southern California Leadership Council, uh, a high-level business leadership group. He previously served as senior vice president of operations and support at the Southern California Gas Compa Company, the nation's largest natural gas company uh, distributor. Uh, a former president and CEO of the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation and also uh, the World Trade Association Los Angeles Long Beach. And in an earlier life, he was a real estate developer. Mary Leslie is president of the Los Angeles Business Council, a business organization that advocates for Los Angeles business leaders on key issues that impact their businesses and their communities. In her previous role as deputy mayor for the city of Los Angeles under Mayor Richard Jordan, uh, Ms. Leslie was responsible for the mayor's business development programs. Prior to that, she was deputy director of the U.S. Small Business Administration, uh, where she oversaw the Northridge earthquake relief dollars for Los Angeles. Finally, uh, right next to me, Jack Soul has a doctorate in epidemiology from UCLA. Uh, as director of environment and resource sustainability, Dr. Soul is responsible for the development strategy and implementation of Southern California Edison sustainability program, programs for internal operations. And this includes activities related to energy and water conservation at the Edison facilities. Uh, he's a former research scientist and founder of a consulting company. And Dr. Sol has published over 30 scientific reports and has worked uh, uh, around the world. Jack uh, currently holds the position of adjunct professor at UCLA School of Public Health and in the Department of Epidemiology. All right, so now you're convinced about uh, our distinguished panel. So I'm going to start with uh, the general question for each of our panelists, and we can begin with uh, Jack. Uh, do you agree with the findings and recommendations of, of the report? Uh, which ones would you highlight or give greater emphasis, or are there things missing from the task force report, things that you would have liked the task force to recommend or to focus on? Yes, Jack. Uh, thank you, Hilda. I think that the uh, congratulations, of course, are in order in, in getting the report to where it is now. It's always a key landmark to, to finish a, a, a set of work so that you can start the conversation. So I think the, the main emphasis that I would uh, point to from uh, my perspective would be the, the forestry issues and also then the uh, change in the water uh, issues. The forestry issues are compelling to us because there is a, a very important set of initiatives with regards to uh, renewable portfolio standards in California and obtaining electricity from alternative sources. And we think that there's a real opportunity for a biomass uh, to, to meet some of this, this need. And this has the joint uh, advantage of forestry management changes to support the development of uh, uh, electricity generating stations as part of biomass. So the intriguing roadblock, as we've been working with the U.S. Forest Service and others, has been the very issue that you mentioned, which was uh, forestry management issues of, of how, how much emphasis should be put on taking biomass out of the forest as a fire suppression tool. If you can turn that into a fuel source for generation facilities, I think you begin to hit two issues at the same time. So I thought that's an intriguing issue. And, and the, the main thing that I want to emphasize on that, however, is a real need to uh, gain coordination on policy. Uh, between different entities, both at the local level, the state level, and the national level. 
because uh, oftentimes there are paths or solutions that we could be a little bit more aggressive on, but the the policy setup currently uh, doesn't doesn't support that. And so, I think uh, while I haven't read the full report, I have focused on the executive summary, and I know that the the real fun details are always in the the part that I didn't read. Uh, I, I think that uh, I'm sure that you probably didn't hit as, as hard and as effectively as you can because nobody ever does the disentangling the policy uh, uh, issues that we face in these kind of areas. The second emphasis that I would put on this would be the issues around water. Uh, as you know, uh, generation of electricity from hydro facilities is an important part of California's uh, uh, greenhouse gas reduction and also going forward if the water uh, uh, currently being stored as snow in the Sierras is no longer able to do that, the existing set of, of uh, dams is going, we're going to have to really address some policy issues around that because not only do you do that for uh, flood control, but fisheries, recreation, uh, agricultural water, uh, uh, water, drinking water for uh, your communities, and of course, ability to do electric generation are all going to be uh, impacted. And so I think, it, again, I would point to the ability for us to have integrated policies going forward uh, as a solution set uh, for those kind of challenges. So those would be the two areas that I would highlight right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Catherine. Uh, I can do this. I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, the Urban Land Institute, just so you know, is a um, international nonprofit organization. We have about uh, 28,000 members worldwide, and what our simple mission is to do is to advocate for the responsible use of land and uh, to support the creation of livable, thriving, sustainable communities. So it's a very simple mission, but a very um, it gives us a lot of opportunity to expand our work into areas of climate change, transportation, infrastructure, uh, things you wouldn't think of when you think of our members, which are mostly real estate developers and uh, private sector interests. But uh, just earlier this year, we completed a report called um, SB 375 Impact Analysis, and we provided that report to the California Air Resources Board. And that report basically was um, an effort for ULI to step into this issue of where does the private sector development community stand on uh, the issue of uh, climate change. And while we were speaking to Senate Bill 375 as a starting point, it really allowed us to have uh, deeper conversations into these issues. And so that report is available on the ULI LA website homepage. It's also available at the ULI National website, and I'd be happy to give that to uh, Hilda and the others so that they can make that available. But what we found in that report was pretty simple. Three things for the state of California to support and positively implement 375. And the reason why I frame this issue around uh, 375 is because um, there's still, I think, some debate within our membership about climate change. And rather than debate that, I would like to just basically refer to the stuff that we've done on the issue. So one thing that I think is critical is that, uh, and I'll focus on the third element of this report, which is around forest fires and really the land use piece of this, the land use um, portion of the analysis that I thought was a very good report, Dan. Um, and I think I've been at this a long time because there was, to me, uh, not a lot of new thinking, but a lot of re-emphasis on the stuff that we need to be doing, and importantly, for the first time, Dan, I think we have the opportunity to stop doing the silo work. This is the first time in my history of, of being a professional planner and transportation um, instructor is that we are now looking at a cross-section. We're leveraging against water, air, land, transportation, housing, um, we're th and, and obviously uh, economics at different levels. This is the first time we're actually putting in place a regulatory framework that makes us um, evaluate each of those levels. So the three things that ULI said is that if you're going to make us do compact development, which at the end of the day, I think there's a growing conclusion that this is an important direction, uh, is that you may need to make sure that the transportation funding is in place. 
a lot of the transportation dollars became at risk in the state. And if it wasn't for Measure R in Los Angeles County, we wouldn't be seeing a lot of investments that are going to be taking place in our region happen. So uh, we're unique in Southern California and LA County, but there's a lot of county, other counties in the state that, that don't have those resources and will not see those investment and capacity enhancements happen in, in their communities. So that's one thing. The second thing, and it's similar to the findings, Dan, is that we believe that the streamlining of the regulatory agencies needs to happen. And whether it's the Strategic Growth Council, which, which is referred to in the report, or the um, California Air Resources Board, or the new creation of the CRC, um, these are important entities that have, we hope, um, a, a responsibility to pull all these pieces together. Because as real estate developers and land planners, um, we, it is a Byzantine system to get development done in any city. Some cities are harder than others, but uh, the fact is, is that there's a lot of regulatory challenges that are placed in front of developers when they do development. And the more complex, the more urban, the more issues such as CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, these are issues that developers have to reconcile on a parcel by parcel level. And I think if there was local and regional and state uh, planning, that this would actually be much better coordinated and therefore the developer um, dollar and the public dollar could go farther in terms of having uh, meaningful projects happen. So that's the second thing that we recommended and was complementary to the report. The third thing is layering the incentives. Um, the fact that we need to pull our legislative and policy directions in the same way, in other words, don't have policies contradict each other, but importantly, have the incentives layered. So if you have a transportation project, make sure that there's affordable housing dollars there, make sure that there's um, uh, some kind of relief in terms of maybe an entitlement process uh, and an approvals process. So in other words, create so many carrots where we want the development to go so that there's sticks and that the developers will say, we have to go there, there's so many opportunities, there's so many ways for us to get a project done that then they gravitate toward those areas. But in terms of, and so those are the three pieces. The two last obviously relate to the um, report, but I would offer that it's, I, I don't think there's enough on the forest and uh, rangeland fires piece because it really is a land use issue. Um, it is so clearly a land use issue. And um, while additional studies and recommendations to evaluate the built environment and new development and all these zoning code issues, I think that um, partnering and collaborating with the Urban Land Institute, with the Building Industry Association, with other um, American Planning Association, there's organizations in the state that we can work together to find common based solutions that then take into account each of the perspectives of each group. But I think that, um, I think there has to be greater consideration because if you're a resident here in Los Angeles, you, you saw us suffer badly this, um, earlier this year from some pretty devastating fires. And um, I think that there was, there was some loss of life. And those, those are just some of the decisions that we need to be thinking harder about as we're looking at the implementation of 375, as we're looking at the issue of climate change for the state, for the region but there are important land use decisions we need to be making and I would, I would offer that if there's an area I think of greater um, analysis, is it's on that third section. I would also offer that this is an important time that we can begin to expand the vernacular around these issues. I found the report to talk about coastal planners and as a planning professional, I've never heard of a coastal planner, but I liked it, and I think that we need to have more thinking around geographically sensitive planning strategies. In other words, if you are a coastal planner, then you need to be thinking about the issues that affect the coastal community and that there are techniques and strategies and, and um, workshops specifically designed for you that you can then bring to your community. Just the way there's transit-oriented development planners and TOD planners and things like that, I think coastal planners, you know, um, uh, different kinds of planning, the, the vernacular and planning community needs to kind of step to the next level. Very good. Should we give you a chance? No, I, you know, there's a wonderful thoughts, both uh, Jackson and Kevin's, but let's, let's hear from everybody and then, uh, because each one triggers some thoughts, of course. Mary, 
anything uh, that you would have liked to have emphasized or that you think might be missing from what you've heard? Uh, um, I think Catherine did a um, great job from the business perspective, but I would add probably a few political points to that just because, unfortunately, we have to live in the, the world of politics um, regarding the report. Um, First of all, you know, congratulations, because I think that's right. I think you're, you've made a huge contribution, and this idea of put a, putting a climate risk council together that would be ongoing to deal with these adaptation issues is, is critical. Um, for our organization, I think we would love to bring this report to our organization and to have it vetted by our members, because our members are going to have perspectives of commercial, retail, um, real estate interests, and many of them are going to be owners of properties that are going to be underwater, apparently, based on your report <laughs> um, soon. So, you know, whether or not, right, whether or not they, they believe um, your, your scientific findings or not, um, they, they might enjoy seeing what the report has to say for real about what's going on. Because, like Catherine, I think um, the good news for the Los Angeles Business Council, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's been around for um, 75 years and really was based in helping US, UCLA, that other institution, um, develop uh, over in Westwood. And so we have a very education-based mission, uh, education and advocacy, which differentiates us. And we tend to do a lot of research. And we've done a lot in the area of sustainability. And our basic position has been that, that green business is good business and that adapting to new climate conditions is just a business opportunity. Now, we are unique, perhaps, sometimes in that attitude, and sometimes it's a hard thing to prove. Because um, one, of, one of the things that struck me about all of it was um, in this mitigation adaptation scenario, um, where is the entrepreneurial adaptation, right? That, that you need market-driven solutions to a lot of these issues because the challenge is, is you don't have the money to buy your way out of all these problems. So that means full engagement with the business community and, and residential homeowners. Now in Los Angeles, we have painfully lived through some very poorly presented um, financial propositions regarding how to meet our utility needs for both energy and water. Now we have to do a better job communicating. See, I'm looking at Ron Gastel because he and I have, have worked on this. Um, so I would argue under this whole public engagement portion of your report that, that you know, the old-fashioned polling and thinking through um, language around how you bring these adaptation strategies to the general public and to elected officials is critical. I mean, we, we are painfully aware of it in, a, in something that we're doing here, which is just sort of a simple idea of how we would scale solar in the city, of, uh, city and county of Los Angeles, which seems so intuitive given um, our natural resources, but, but difficult to do. So um, uh, those are, uh, I think, a few of my initial thoughts. Okay, okay Lee. Thank you. Yes. Um, my issue uh, wasn't addressed. Uh, my dog wouldn't hunt. <laughs> uh, the Southern California Leadership Council is a group of CEOs uh, from throughout the region uh, joined by the four former governors, um, really trying to work out what I would call solution paths for problems like this, quite frankly. And at the end of the day, and I think it's been alluded to, um, business likes as much certainty as it can get. And uh, what I wanted to be answered was, how are we going to pay for this? And uh, we talked a lot about it. And uh, we, we came up with some directions, um, but, but no ultimate recommendations other than further study um, with a couple of perhaps focuses. Let me, let me tell you a little story about, I, I live in Santa Barbara, and uh, the community that I live in was a kind of a unique coastal development where in 1975, um, a few pieces of infrastructure were put in, including uh, three beach cabanas, two of them on the bluffs and one up on, on a hill overlooking uh, the coast. Um, one of them still were, we put it in 1975, and the other two aren't. In fact, the sites aren't even there anymore because the cliffs eroded during El Nino, and we had to, in an emergency basis, move a couple of cabanas very quickly, a couple hundred yards back, so that we didn't have to move them again in a few years. So this is a very real issue, and I tend to think in terms of real estate and, and uh, the uh, issues that relate to use of the land. Let me just uh, give you one more Santa Barbara story. Um, about 18 months ago, uh, some of the people who 
I think would call themselves coastal planners. I think the surfers are the ultimate coastal planners because we plan storm by storm, but, um, and, that, and that's why I'm there. But uh, some of the coastal planners decided they wanted to string a red ribbon um, along what they thought would be the new coastline in uh, about 50 years. And they started stringing the ribbon and all of a sudden the community fathers and mothers said, get that ribbon out of here because it started marching up State Street and uh, a lot of other parts of the community. And of course, um, that was a kind of a shocking visual uh, statement about the sort of information that this council wants to develop as common knowledge, if you will, uh, for the people of California and, and quite frankly for the users of the land in California. Um, there has now been a case that Dan and I learned about, and I don't have a, a citation for it, that we learned about at the Bren School uh, that relates to inundation from some coastal erosion, I believe, uh, that affected a, I, I'm, I'm guessing it was a homeowner, but, uh, but I'm not abs absolutely certain about that. But it had to do with the right and ability to rebuild in the inundated area. And I understand that the court, and this must be at uh, a superior court or municipal court level, struggled mightily and kind of came to the conclusion that, well, yes, you may still own that, even though it's underwater, but you may not be able to use it anymore. Um, and I'm not sure that's where the ultimate decision on this issue is going to come out when you, when you come to realize what uh, mean high tide line means in California in terms of things like uh, uh, you know, the state's ownership versus private ownership. All of this is very uncertain right now, but with a lot of dynamic in terms of the information that's going to be developed uh, as a result of recommendations like this. And I, I think what I would put on the table for everyone is, um, can the policy move faster than the practicality? Um, and I say that in this sense, that those in Santa Barbara who may want to redevelop or develop new property that's somewhere between that ribbon and the ocean, um, may run into lenders who are no longer willing to uh, undertake the loan because there's too much uncertainty involved, in which case they're probably going to see if they can find someone in the insurance community who will provide the lender with the insurance protection to make the loan on the property. Um, and at some point, the insurance community is gonna realize that there's too many miles of coastline uh, to start providing that sort of insurance for without some new rules. Um, the ultimate issue is who is the insurer of last resort? Uh, in many ways, it is going to be the land owner if they can't find financing, if they can't find insurance. Um, my guess is that California is not gonna be able to be the insurer of last resort, although some people are gonna wanna make them the insurer, and I'm not sure the federal government's gonna be the insurer of last resort. So how, how are we gonna pay for this? Before we go on, I, I will just make a quick comment because, I'm sorry, because Lee did bring it up. Uh, one of the uh, sessions we held, uh, just uh, information gathering, was at the Brand School of Environmental Management at, at, at UC Santa Barbara. And it's, for those of you who haven't been there, about as idyllic <laughs> a public facility as you'll find along the coast as they sit right on the beach at Santa Barbara. And their concern, of course, was about sea rise. Uh, and, and I mention that because it's public. That is, there's an enormous amount of public investment that also is going to be affected along these lines. And, and what the incentives are and how we deal with that is really even more difficult to think through than the private sector strategies. And actually, that's why Lee was saying, I don't know if those of you have heard him, his issue hasn't been addressed. He constantly said, good, now let's think through constructively how to move forward and, and cover the costs here. And uh, he, we, we got some answers there that had to do with, this is not a time to t take up spending money, Dan, uh, but that's the feedback I got. Okay, go on. Yes, sure. Sir, Good morning, everybody. Um, LA Chamber of Commerce uh, welcomed this report and supports the primary recommendations. Um, like Mary's organization, we have not had a detailed conversation about the report, and we look forward to doing that. I think the value of this report, from my perspective, is that because of the diversity of the group, the experience of the group, and because we decided not to get into the science per se, uh, but to get down to the practicality, um, we really took a big step forward for this state to 
to take us into the practical world, even if we're just asking questions. And that's a lot of what we're doing in this report. Uh, the business community will respond much more directly to that practical discussion. I think if you did a poll of uh, the LA Chamber or the business community in general, they'd be like everybody else in this country and this state, uh, aware of potential climate change, um, not overly concerned, maybe not even convinced. Um, and I know for certain that uh, our businessmen are not going about their daily business and thinking about their investments in terms of climate change, with the possible exception of folks that are in the renewable energy business or like me, I've got a water conservation business and so I'm thinking about this all the time. Um, a couple of observations um, more specifically about the business community. I think there is a, a real concern about how we implement public policy in this area and what it means to our competitiveness in the business world and our competitiveness in the state in its entirety. Uh, concerned that there is not enough emphasis among policy uh, holders or po policy makers in keeping us competitive. Uh, concern about CEQA, already feeling that CEQA needs to be dialed back or refined in some way, and then you layer on climate change with the uncertainty of how you incorporate that into the environmental review process. A great deal of concern about that in the business community. Um, and of course, cost. Um, who are the beneficiaries? How do you define them? Who's going to pay uh, for these things? We're seeing across the board that public that are already sort of invested in their infrastructure or their entitlements um, are not anxious to, uh, to pay for what they perceive as somebody else's problem. So big issues there. Um, my background is in, is in water. A couple comments about the report on water. Um, Climate change, is, it's, it's interesting when you talk to uh, folks in the environmental community, um, the response initially was, uh, at least I think for many, well, conservation is the answer. Um, all the things that the environmentalists want to see changed in the water world are then justified by climate change. And then you talk to the water guys, and the water guys say, ah, yeah, well, let's build some more dams. Let's build some more canals. So a uh, huge gulf here really in, in the water community, both environmentalists and water purveyors on what to do about climate change, and of course, all over the map on who's gonna pay for it. This report does a really good job of uh, concluding that we need um, all these tools. Um, and um, I, I think that um, we had a very good discussion about just uh, limiting our response to conservation, for example. Um, in this state, we've been able to manage our water, our water demands because we, frankly, are fairly inefficient in many parts of the state. So you have a lot of flux here that allows you to deal with these varieties because you can conserve. But as you go out 20, 30 years, if you are conserving the way we say, you suddenly don't have a lot of flux. And so demand is pretty hard. Um, so you need to think about that and decide, well, maybe we need some infrastructure investments as well. Um, then we need to think about unintended consequences. I know that uh, here at, at the university, a study was done on the LA Department of Water and Power System, and the conservation that we're doing so diligently and well uh, may have resulted or contributed to some unintended consequences to our old pipes. Um, so all of these things will have to be thought through, and I think our report uh, does uh, highlight that. Um, we didn't get to see a picture of the delta in a climate change world, whether you've got more runoff coming at the delta, this very sensitive confluence of the Sacramento River, the San Joaquin River, a totally artificial environment today with levees that will not uh, withstand an earthquake. Um, and they will be underwater uh, with the predicted climate change. And so those people who think that if they live inland, they're not affected by the coast, and the sea level rise uh, really have to, a, a great awakening because our, not all of our water supply, but much of our water supply comes through the Delta for our entire agricultural community and much of what we consume down here. We all have a great deal at risk from climate change in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. I think I'll leave it at that.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those, uh, a very thoughtful uh, responses. I, I wonder whether uh, now you can uh, begin to think about uh, some of the uh, threats in particular, sea level rise and so on. I, I think Catherine started uh, thinking about this um, uh, and how it affects your, how it might affect your particular organization. And uh, I, I know Jack also talked quite a bit about forestry, but, the there, but there are, uh, there may be other issues as well. And if I, if you can take a, a few minutes to, to address how you think uh, some of these impacts uh, will be of particular concern uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, Edison. Well, under the risk of being non-responsive to the question, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I think at least I am, so uh, we can argue about that later. I think the biggest risk to an, an entity like ours is uh, lack of prioritization and not finding value in the proposition. You, you, you say, well, where's the money going to come from? And I would say to you that the money's going to come from us finding a business value to address this issue. So as a principle, I think that is a guiding light for us because that's from running a business, that's what we, that's what keeps us successful. So is there, is there actually a value proposition for us in California on this? And I say absolutely there is. And if we don't get it right, then we're really going to have real cost. But if we get it right, then I think that we will have served you know, our, our, our function as running businesses. Yeah. Well, the, the, I just, the key to that is going to be uh, prioritization of what, and, and prioritization includes not only what you do, but what order do you do it in. And I think that's going to be uh, going to be the real challenge for us is to find the order to get the order right. And policy integration is going to be at that doorstep. And so those are kind of my kind of views of where we are. I know it's a little high level, but but I think that to me really engages the conversation about where we think our, our key interests are. We can waste so much money in California because we, we have been blessed with, with, with so much, but we don't have enough now to, to waste on this because the, the sense of urgency has to be here now. I just, I didn't mean to interrupt, Jack. Um, I think one of the things, obviously the real estate market has um, been suffering and will continue to suffer for a number of more years until we actually climb out of this recession. But if uh, somebody doesn't have a job, then they can't rent a unit, buy a unit, or lease a unit. And so for the real estate community, jobs has become a very important thing for us. And so one of the um, things that ULI is looking at is infrastructure and kind of retooling some of our development communities or uh, development groups and sectors around infrastructure. And public-private partnerships and the opportunities to kind of look at our um, our current state of infrastructure condition um, and understanding that those are areas of opportunity and growth for the real estate market, whether it's institutional facilities or public works facilities or uh, whatever kind of infrastructure system that we need. Um, we also consider housing as part of infrastructure, but certainly we won't be getting to that till the market recovers from, from where we're at right now. But I think Jack is exactly right. One of the things, we just um, last week had a meeting with former governor of Vermont, Howard Dean, who um, said he's right in the mouth of this whole thing in Washington, and we're trying to get a sense for what is going on in Washington vis-a-vis -vis California. And so infrastructure is a very big issue, and how we prioritize our infrastructure investments is exactly what we're trying to figure out. So is it in transportation? Is it in water systems? Is it in these, and actually the report does talk a good deal about the social systems, the social infrastructure that we have not been investing in. And so it's, it, to us, it's jobs. And then that means units sold, rented, or leased. So for us, it's all part of a very important economic development cycle and helping our public sector colleagues understand how to leverage the private sector community and how our private sector entity can reinvent themselves while they go through this kind of downturn in the real estate market. Um, 
I, I guess um, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Catherine, um, the, the point about jobs, because I think um, that's one of the key connecting of the dots, like when you lay out the resistance uh, or uh, uh, resilience and retreat, that, that um, in those squares, there's these other implications are spelled out. Because I think the more the dots are connected, the better off we are. Because part of what we're trying to do in this exercise we're in here in the city of LA on solar is connect the ARA funding for um, job training right. with, 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 with the workforce development investment we made and then tie that back to the policy you're trying to drive and then the, the, the business implication of why this is a good investment and, and make it make sense on a lot of, so the resilience section I think could be expanded on to get these other yeah. very core issues in play. I think the, um, the issue of prioritization is a very important one. Um, I think we did have some agreement that at some level the beneficiary does have to pay. Uh, and business value is certainly one measure of that if it's a, a business use. Uh, if it's a personal use, it's a, a personal value. Um, if people will stop to realize what the real cost implications are of this across land use and, and construction of infrastructure in California, we've got to come to grips very quickly with, first of all, how to think about the infrastructure we're building now in terms of how it may relate to cl climate change impact uh, in the future. Um, I won't get into the high-speed rail to nowhere, but I think $4 billion could be better spent on issues like this at this point. And those are the choices we're going to have to make because we simply don't have the revenues uh, to do everything. I couldn't agree more that ultimately the more jobs, the more revenues we will have. Uh, and that all relates to land use at the end of the day. And so we've got to figure out how to continue to make good use of uh, real estate, um, both for housing and for jobs, quite frankly. Um, but we've got to realize that we've got very limited dollars to get the whole job done. Uh, I think I'll point to two risks. Um, w one is the, uh, the science-based decision-making. Um, while I think we would all uh, endorse science-based decision-making, um, many times, uh, particularly in areas as soft as this is, it ends up um, resulting in a call for more data before action. Um, and there are many, many problems out there that probably can't wait, should not wait for science to be perfect. So how do we communicate the risk, that is, how do we communicate to policymakers and the public um, the best path forward in listening to the science and, and making decisions? Um, that's why I personally really like the idea of this council, uh, the balance council that's in mind, to help us navigate through that. Um, I think another, another issue that, uh, or risk, is that um, maybe this is a challenge to the educational community, that policymakers at the local level, the state level, just don't get it, that they're not sufficiently educated on how to grapple with this, that they won't make the right decisions. Um, and if you just leave it to the normal interest groups advocating for their thing, um, something as important as this and the priorities that we need um, will, will take back seat to business as usual. So huge, I think, risk that the educational community doesn't have the means or the focus to recognize that that's a, that's a big risk right there. Thank you very much. I, I just want to emphasize that a number of you, in a real sense, uh, are pointing out that if there, if there would be a next step uh, to this uh, report, in a real sense, it would be very important to spell out what uh, we kind of know the implications for jobs under the resistance, the protection measures, but on the resilience, uh, what kind of implication for jobs are there? Uh, because as Jack put it, you have to figure out the value proposition. And, and definitely for California today, jobs is number one at this point. And so, uh, it's really very important to figure out how to strategize uh, for, for 
the next steps of, uh, of this uh, report with respect to uh, the economic issues altogether. Okay, I'm going to open it up to uh, uh, public questions and answers, but first uh, I want to give the panelists an opportunity to talk about uh, this issue of mitigation versus adaptation. Uh, up to now, most policy has really been aimed at reducing greenhouse gases, mitigation in climate change circles. Uh, and uh, uh, I wonder if you could um, discuss from the perspective of your organization uh, whether it has taken a position on mitigation and, uh, and how you see uh, those efforts related to uh, this um, uh, topic that we're discussing to get, uh, today, and that is adaptation. Do you see potential conflicts? Do you see synergies and so on? Um, so yes, uh, how do you uh, uh, think about it from the Edison perspective? Yeah. You know, we're fully engaged on the, on the mitigation uh, issues associated with uh, either the generation of electricity, the renewable portfolio standard, or the way we operate our fleet, or our commitment to engage in electric transportation, which is going to be a game changer for us, uh, both as running electric utility, but also in California. The biggest issue is going to be how customers respond to all of these initiatives. Uh, and that's going to be the wild card for us in terms of uh, that, both on the price issue and also on the behavioral changes associated with all of this stuff that we're proposing. We're hopeful that through aggressive energy conservation, that while the price of electricity will go up, the bills won't, uh, but that's, that's a bet. Um, I think the biggest concern I have is that as we look at, and this is where I welcome the report the most, as, as we look at the issue of mitigation, uh, our scientific colleagues uh, are pretty unambiguous that we're going to blow right through, you know, we started off at 280 uh, parts per million in the atmosphere of carbon, and we're going to blow right through 400, and we don't know quite where we're going to end up. But you don't want to put a mitigation strategy in that has this illusion that you're not going to have climate heating because you're just going to waste your money on those extra mitigation activities. It's, it's akin to, you know, so I think having the dual debate in parallel between mitigation and mm -hmm. adaptation will likely, if we do it right, end up in creating more rational mitigation strategies or that the target for mitigation will actually be more reasonable. That's my hope. And, and so if, uh, and, I, and I think creating a council like you recommended could help achieve that. The bad news on mitigation, or, or the distressing news on mitigation, is that California, no matter what we do, has a pressing small impact on climate heating because it's, it's a world issue, right? But on the adaptation part, we actually own our own role, you know? So, so maybe there is a path forward that's actually a little bit different in the sense that we're at others' will as it relates to the overall climate. We should and, and are doing our part and leading on that. But on adaptation, we actually own our property and own those impacts. Well, in terms of land use, um, the mitigation opportunities uh, are already in place. I think uh, the sustainable community strategies that each of the MPOs, the Metropolitan Planning Organizations, have to create as a result of Senate Bill 375 is a perfect tool to, to get at, <coughs> to, excuse me, to get at the uh, land use issue and the component in terms of um, uh, greenhouse gases and uh, mobile uh, vehicle exhaust uh, and pollution. So one of the things that, um, that we have been looking at is essentially how to have the SCSs address a lot of these issues. So working with the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization here, the Southern California Association of Governments directly to have them understand how the real estate community and planning community is thinking about these issues. And it's important to know that the SESs are going to be rolling out over the next, what, three or four years. And then there's going to be, a, after the fourth year, uh, a reevaluation of those, um, those studies and those uh, strategies. So 
what's nice is that as we begin to increase our understanding of technology, whether it's, it's fuel cells and other kinds of energy technology, whether it's we move into desalinization, which is, which is another thing that we were talking about in the report. And there's a lot of new technology that's going to be coming online so quickly that I think that the SCS is for land use and, and certainly when we're thinking about compact development and how as we kind of grow smart, smarter and more sustainable, um, that those are going to be, those are already in place. It's already there. The market, what's funny is that we said in our analysis that the market was already moving toward more compact development anyway. Uh, people can had their day, if you want to get a, uh, get a single family detached unit at the end of a cul-de-sac in the Inland Empire, that's fine. You could do that. Uh, but if you wanted a affordable loft in downtown next to a transit station that was a little bit harder to do. So we needed to actually balance out our development. The market was already moving in that, in that direction. Our younger uh, population and our older population was looking, was looking specifically for those, con those new um, offers and, and simply the market had not yet met the demand. So I wanted, I wanted to say that um, in the new market reality of real estate development, uh, there's going to be the lending institutions and the, and the debt that's going to be allowed is not going to support, I think, unsustainable development. I think that there's a new awareness from our, our lending institutions about these issues. And uh, while they haven't figured out what that means on a, a balance sheet yet, they are figuring out that um, uh, sustainable green development, a LEED certified building, is part of their kind of business uh, principles as well. And so I would offer that uh, it, the lending community is getting there. They aren't fully there, I'll be honest with you, but they will be getting there. By the time we come out of the real estate cycle, we will, I think, have a much more educated uh, uh, lending uh, uh, industry. But I, I just want to close with, um, I think that, that uh, we're hearing a lot of similar things, that there is a time that, as Jack was saying, that we are at the precipice, I think, for the state of California on the front end of this. And we can either botch this up poorly, or we can actually do this in a way that keeps the state, and if not, improves our competitiveness. Um, yeah, the money's not there, but I don't, I think if we get stuck on that, then we'll never start. And so I think the investments need to be thought through, and we'll figure out how to pay for it. Maybe it's you know, Australian money, maybe it's Chinese money, or maybe it's, you know, but we, we're going to figure out how to do it because that's the ingenuity that Californians have. And so I look, you know, ULI is trying to be at the front end of that, and um, we're certainly trying to add our voice to this issue. Hill, if I may just chime in here for a second, which is because you brought up the mitigation versus adaptation dichotomy, and the task force uh, really didn't see this as a dichotomy at all. They saw this as the, the other part of the, the discussion, the one that had received the least formal regulatory endorsement because there's no AB 32 for adaptation. We don't have that as a formal regulatory strategy. But I just want to underscore that it was the very Mary Nichols head of CARB who's, who's implementing AB 32 and Michael Chrisman, who was head of the resources agency when they were developing this, who applauded our efforts and put their staff and their resources at our disposal as a group because they could see the big picture and, and they were being, if I, if I can read into the conversations I did have with both, quite frustrated at the public didn't understand these both needed to go forward. And sometimes they may be at loggerheads, but basically they had to be seen as complementary. So our voice was to bring a, a cross section of people in the state outside of government, outside of the regulatory apparatus to say, we think it's serious also and we want to help. And we want to do so by some pointed recommendations rather than the 120 that are in the resources report, which can be dismissed because there's so many of them. No, I, I'm really glad you just clarified that, Dan, because um, I was thinking through, even when I walked in, I, I asked Ron and Ping, you know, where, where does the SCAG process work, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this report? Do, do these marry up at any point, or are these two separate activities? Because we're engaged in the SCAG 375 compliance, and we worked with um, um, many people here on these issues. But I guess what I was thinking was that um, even the attempt uh, over this last year to roll back 23 
and then the repercussions at SCAG that we had in, in the middle of the year about could we move our, our mitigation number, number down, right, on what we had, to, our compliance number. So, and then watching this, our new governor-elect come in, and he's already under siege, right, with can he meet the RPS goals. And, and I raise this only because I think this rubric that we're in with the RPS goals and this disconnect between what they mean and what they cost was never worked out. If I, if I, the day that we adopted 40% in the city of LA, I thought to myself, there should be a business revolution. Okay, anyone paying attention must know that they, we can't afford that. You're talking about renewable portfolio <laughs> standard. Okay, I mean, Mary. yes, I am. Renewable, renewable port portfolio, because that is really the rubric we're under, yeah. right? That's driving all of this. So, so it might be better than you know what you're doing with this adaptation strategy. Is I think you're going to the the higher issue. Uh, because what I loved about what you were talking about in the report is this cost-effective long-term investment choices. Okay, this is huge because we went to that other institution that we are doing research with you now in the next phase. <laughs> but we went to UCLA and we did economic modeling. Okay, now what a, what a novel thought, okay, on, on w how we would price the feed-in tariff for solar. Right. Okay, what did we learn? We learned that you, you can be cost-effective um, over time and get a savings. But if you play a short-term game of one year, three year, you're dead in the water. So this is the really tough education part about dealing with elected officials that get elected for two years, four years, right? They, they're not in the long-term game, okay? They're in the short-term game. <laughs> so this disconnect between the way our politics works and what our need is from a policy perspective. Um, you know, the more we could do here on, on, on looking at the long-term investment choices of even the, the things that you're suggesting now because, because people are not thinking that way about long-term investment. And, 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 and what I like about it is in, in the solar situation, it's perceived as being an alternative that's too expensive vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other renewables. But, but, the, but the truth is um, the model that UCLA came back with is, is more cost competitive than any tariff pricing in North America right now or Europe. And, and that it shows that we can do this in a cost competitive way. But, but the uphill education on getting people to believe that is just yeah. enormous. Okay, I'm really done. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I, I'm going to be the skunk at the garden party on this. By the way, I agree with everything that Jack said. I, I think so far California is be, being very foolish in terms of its mitigation, and that will affect adaptation in this way. Uh, and I'm not saying that renewables aren't important. I'm not saying that they can't pay for themselves over time. They certainly can. Here's the problem. All we have generated so far is regulation and more regulation and more regulation between AB 32 and SB 375. That's regulation, folks. That's not incentive. That's not the how do we grow the jobs while we address these very important issues. Let me give you two examples where I think we could think much differently and be much more successful in the end, both at mitigation and at adaptation. It takes SB 375. The number one strategy in SB 375 should be how we bring jobs to housing, how we get people shorter commutes out of bringing green tech jobs to housing in California. Green tech jobs, what are they? Well, we better decide what they are, and we better decide that they're not just solar panel installers, but they are in fact all the people who develop, research, produce the products and applications for tomorrow that will achieve the climate change reductions that California wants to be a leader in. Now, that doesn't mean just measuring the emissions of production in California. It means attracting to California and incenting and building a green tech economy that generates products that are sold to the world and ultimately reduce the greenhouse gases. Now, I'm, I'm afraid Jack's right. I don't think we're going to uh, do this fast enough, and I think we're going to have to live with the ultimate issue of adaptation. Um, another example, $4 billion for a high-speed rail or $4 billion to create a green trade corridor that moves goods over land through the ports of LA and Long Beach rather than through the expansion of the Panama Canal 
because every container that moves through our ports reduces the greenhouse gas that would otherwise be caused by hauling it through the Panama Canal. So double bang for the buck. The ports need to modernize, they need to green. At the same time, we can, we can save and create the jobs that are related to international trade, to wholesale trade, that actually support the manufacturing base that's here by having an, a jobs policy as part of mitigation and ultimately that will pay for through the taxes that are paid by people who have jobs and who can pay the higher cost by the way of renewables um, by having a vibrant economy. We're not working on the economy, folks. We're working on regulation right now. Mitigation, adaptation. Um, I think from, from my perspective as a lawyer, I am very wary of talking about adaptation um, in the context of CEQA. Um, we're down that road already, but um, so many times CEQA has been used to stop projects. Um, and we frankly need a whole lot of new infrastructure so if there's a way to go down separate paths, um, or perhaps to characterize to the public and policymakers that what we're talking about with adaptation is the priorities, that, the priority setting that we talked about earlier, um, um, perhaps um, we can find a way to uh, not get drawn down in what I think is going to continue to be um, very difficult, and that's this, this uh, discussion over what CEQA ought to be. Um, I think it will delay adaptation if we end up going that path perhaps as just sort of a trailer on a, on a truck that's already headed down the road, the CEQA truck. I just want to offer one thing. In, in ULI, one of the big issues we found in our report of, at Senate Bill 375 was that this was a perfect time to look at CEQA at a, at if, because it's one of those um, uh, regulatory constraints that is cross-purposes to our new stated goals. Uh, CEQA is one of the biggest issues for developers who do infill, brownfield, transit-oriented development. One of the biggest challenges is to go into an urban built environment site and to find a whole bunch of stuff from the previous century that you got to deal with, and it's a major constraint and so one of the things, one of the biggest issues we raised in our report um, was that uh, CEQA has got to be looked at, whether it's CEQA reform or reevaluation of our priorities, but that has got to be one of the important next directions that the state takes in terms of the implementation of the legislation. Ah, thank you very much uh, for a very thoughtful discussion. Now we can take some uh, questions uh, for, from the public. Okay. Thank you. Do I need a microphone? Right behind yes. you. It works. So I'm JP Bardet. I'm an engineer, I'm not a planner. Just a disclaimer right here. Uh, I think the panel is quite aware of the uncertainties associated with the predictions in global climate change. Uh, and this introduced some wide variations in what you see in the predictions. It can be, be higher, it can be lower. So we need to adapt with, to things which we're not sure what they are indeed. And that creates, of course, some feeling of uneasiness. We feel like we don't know what we're dealing with. And I think it's this natural question is how can we reduce these uncertainties so we can come up with a better adaptation, cheaper, more cost-effective, uh, something that we can plan for instead of guessing the wild and creating doomsday scenarios in our newspapers all days. So is there, the question would be, what is the suggested road implementation to reduce uncertainties so we can adapt more effectively? Is there any suggestion? Should we use the bodies of governments we have, such as USGS uh, or agency, state agencies, the DOE, whatever? What are they? Are we going to put pressure on them? Or are there any plans, actually, to indeed uh, ask scientists 
to work more closely to engineers and create some new knowledge which will reduce these uncertainties. So what are the plans here to increase knowledge to reduce uncertainties? This is the question. If I might take a stab at that, uh, that is a, a central issue. And that's where the Climate Risk Council concept came into being. And uh, what I haven't discussed is the, the kind of organizational logic behind it. But part of it was to, to bring together uh, different uh, uh, segments of society on the Climate Risk Council, which had up to five people, that it would be analogous to a Council of Environmental Quality at the national level, but it would be the state advising the governor and have some uh, um, authority over the variety of agencies, also bring about some policy coordination within them. And the, the staff would be your scientists, and the council would be made up of this diverse group, partly to review and think about its practical implications, and frankly, to give it some political legitimacy, but to be right there at the, uh, at the, uh, at the governor's request so that the public understands that this is a high priority in going forward and because it needs to evolve, they are the, making it clear there is enormous bounds of uncertainty, so there's some precaution called for. But the thing that I think Ron has mentioned, and, and maybe Lee and others a little bit, is one of the real concerns of everybody in the room was the freezing in our tracks effect of this uh, uh, uncertainty. And this came from the environmentalists concerned about habitat protection and species, and those concerned about CEQA having another layer of uh, or giving other uh, ammunition to simply say we're not going to do anything until we, we get precise knowledge, which we will not have. So this is going to require judgment, which is why the panel called for is not made up of scientists. It's made up of a diverse uh, representation from the state of people who will, will ask to render some judgment. That's, that's, that's why that became the number one solid step forward that we need to take to start this process going forward. Thank you. Yeah, um, in a sense, decisions ultimately will not be made that way much as they haven't been in the past. Um, large public works projects um, are either made by government, if government's going to do it, and then if you layer on beneficiary pays, there's a big argument about who's going to pay for it. Um, private sector money will try to rationalize, um, well, how big do I need to make it because, or how small can I make it? Because at the end of the day, it has to pencil out. Um, and big public agencies are going to take on these risks or these costs, are looking down the road, and they have competing questions. Um, one, do I make it bigger to try and deal with the variability and this uncertainty? And two, how do I rationalize paying for all this flexibility and uncertainty? And can I convince the ratepayers you know, to let me do that? because you're not going to have the answer going in. Thank you. Didn't come up? Yeah, I could, I could talk loud enough. Okay. Can you hear me? Sure. Well, I, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for holding this discussion. I'm a plan, I was a planning student here, so it's really nice to see that this discussion is happening. I actually work for a public utility right now, so this is probably more a question geared towards Jack and Lee. With um, CARB, with the RES standards, with um, the CEC and AQMD being the permitting um, sources for building renewables, how do you get the three agencies to really work together so renewables can be built? As a public utility, it's, and I work in the resource planning department, I won't say which one, um, it's really difficult to get renewables starting from the ground with transmission being built in a reasonable amount of time to meet the guidelines that the state of California is setting up. So how would you start the dialogue for the three agencies, the CEC, AQMD, and CARB, really working together so this kid could start? Everybody <laughs> want to speak, but Jack is going to speak. Um, well, actually, I think it's, it's working pretty well in California. Uh, we have the RED process, which is a uh, process uh, over the last uh, almost five years now, which has designated uh, corridors for transmission. And uh, we had to turn the PUC uh, policies and CEC policies on their head. Previously, you had to have generation sited, and then you'd build transmission to it. Now what we do is we build transmission to areas, and generation is now put in those areas. Uh, that's a substantial difference. Uh, 
And the Tehachapi area is the best example right now where we have a transmission line, what we used to call a transmission line to nowhere because it literally went to a big part of, part of land up in the Tehachapis. But now, as it turns out, it's a, te a transmission line to solar and wind generation. The financing of the generation doesn't occur unless you have transmission inner ties, and so that's how that works. So I would refer you to the CEC and the CPUC red process and the transmission line siting process. We've also identified working with BLM and others uh, areas of the desert which are being marked for solar and wind. And this is causing a lot of controversy amongst uh, our environmental friends because the environmental impacts of solar and wind are really quite large and you also have taken the consideration of the, of the, gener of the transmission. Um, so that being said, uh, we are much better off now uh, because of that process than we were five, six years ago. But I will echo uh, your comments, and that is the, the CEQA process in California is actually at odds with good climate issues because if it takes us 10 years to site a generation or transmission line, and if, and if that process is designed to slow us down, then we will never meet our California goals on environmental quality. So, but that's where I would refer you to, and I'm, I'm much more optimistic than I was a number of years ago, but uh, if you want to chat more about details on that, I can happy to do that. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, that it's, that it's improving because at the, at the start it was not, it was, it was not heading in the right direction. Um, I, I want to suggest that there may be other models um, for siting uh, that need to be considered where you can actually get a twofer or a threefer. Um, and they may not be, in some cases, quite as good in terms of the solar value of the site, although many of them are quite good. Um, but I would suggest to you that there is a lot of farming going on for a very low uh, uh, value crop. Um, cotton, although cotton's getting pretty expensive these days. Uh, alfalfa, uh, that tend to be very high water users. Um, and I really believe that if we put the right incentives in place, people who are farming cotton uh, or alfalfa these days, or maybe even corn in some cases, but I'm thinking of more of the inland uh, uh, sunnier areas, um, could be incented to become solar farmers, um, put solar installations on some of that farmland that's using a lot of water and producing very low value crops. Um, most of those are already on the grid. You don't have to build major transmission to them. So there is a reduction in the cost of transmission. Um, if, if we create some twofer and threefer incentive programs like that, then the farmers, part of the deal could be that the farmers put the water they were using for their crops into some sort of regional water bank uh, where the value of that water uh, can be used for any number of things, whether it's environmental mitigation obviously human consumption use, um, where, the, where the farmer, if the farmer owns the water, gets compensated for it. So they get compensated for their land use, they get compensated for the water use, but the water is going to go to a much higher beneficial use than it was, uh, and we're going to, we're going to add additional uh, power transmission in areas where we don't have to build major uh, new grid. Just on that point, by the way, I may, Germany has already adopted a strategy like that and moving to 30 percent uh, solar power right now based on this kind of incentive strategy in the agricultural area. Urban also, but really it's big in the agricultural area. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rod Amos, energy efficiency student at LA Trade Tech. They have a special program there, a certification program under the Green Workforce Education Program. It is uh, very good to be at Trade Tech because they seem to be a magnet for the Aura funds. And these great certification programs are the reason why I'm reinventing myself for the jobs of today and tomorrow. And coming to these forums, such as this one, last month's Metropolitan Water District Forum over at their headquarters downtown LA, helps me to kind of strategize on what classes I need to take on, which way I need to go, what certifications I'm going to need for the jobs of today and tomorrow. And uh, Catherine, you touched on jobs being number one concern for ULI. And also, Lee, you touched on jobs versus policy. I'm looking for advice or direction from you all in terms of the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow 
and how people like myself who have a little bit of time, a little bit of money left in the bank, that can reinvest in our education so that we'll have something to go to regarding uh, the jobs of today and tomorrow. So I throw this out to anyone. Which way do you think we should go for those of us who are uh, re-educating ourselves and looking for new jobs? I'll start, and I'm sure Catherine's going to have perspective on this too, but it all depends on whether the state gets smart about attracting and, and creating those jobs here versus Oregon, Arizona. Uh, if we keep chasing the intels out of California to our neighboring states, you won't be looking in California for those jobs. You'll be looking at surrounding states for those jobs. So it has a lot to do with policies we put in place uh, to grow the jobs while we are going through this, this major transmission for, uh, transition from an energy uh, and, and water uh, standpoint. Catherine? Um, Mary, I don't know, Mary, if wanted, you wanted to talk about um, some of the work you're doing with the Workforce Investment Board, or I don't know, Jack, if you have something that you'd like to offer. But what we're trying to do, well, I'm an instructor. I teach. And so um, a few years ago in the planning school, it was very difficult to tell the students that there was a job for them after they got out of the planning school. It was a depressing time. All the cities were cutting back staff, and, um, and uh, the private sector was hemorrhaging. And so now, today, I, I'm much more optimistic about being able to place my graduate students that, that are looking to, to do something different. There's uh, a few of my ex-students in in, in participating today, and some who have reinvented themselves as well, saying, you know, I did this for 15, 20 years, I want to do something else. But I think the, the opportunity around understanding these issues vis-a-vis, -vis, not just, you know, it's green or sustainable, it is a new lifestyle. It is the new lifestyle, and whether it's California or other places. Um, I just came back from Australia, and um, these folks have been doing this forever. It's a big, giant desert island, and um, it, it's amazing to me that they don't think of anything as being non-sustainable. I think we're kind of there, too. We're almost there, but, but everything is connected to each other, and everything has kind of requirements in terms of how it's built, where it's built, um, who's building it. So I think what you are doing is exactly what I've recommended to my students, which is to get out and talk to people, meet more people, um, develop your own Rolodex. Because I think it's the industries um, that we have not yet created. I mean, I think of things, for example, the iPad, you know, and the iTouch, and the iPhone, and the, all those things. You know, five, ten years ago, they weren't there. We were just, somebody and I were, Jack and I were joking about our cell phones, and. You know, they used to be the size of bricks, and you couldn't kind of hold on to them under your ear. And now they're, you know, you can almost fit them in your ear. And so, you know, the technology is moving so quickly. And um, whether you're going to go into development, or you're going to go into planning, or you're going to go into energy renewals on that side, wherever it is, it's, it's moving so quickly. Um, I know that in just teaching my courses, the technology of uh, engaging the public has changed. Social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, MySpace, uh, LinkedIn, all these things, all these new platforms have offered residents, everybody, a new ways and new portals to get involved. And so even just teaching, you know, strategies of getting different communities of color engaged in these issues has changed. And so while, we, um, while we're, we are just like, what I think is we're at a crossroads, we are moving so quickly that it's just important to always stay on the front end, find your niche, and then go after it. But I would always say, you know, be that rolling stone. Just keep going and keep learning uh, because there are so many new opportunities and they're created almost all the time. I, I, I do agree with Lee that, that California is a very expensive state to start a business in. And I started a nonprofit, and it was a very expensive nonprofit to operate. But I think the, the creativity is in this state. Uh, the ingenuity, the academic institutions. There are so many great opportunities that are here in California that you simply can't find in other places. And so I also think California is a petri dish. We're a bit of a living laboratory. We're going through these things. We may kind of bump and hit ourselves along the way. But a lot of other states um, are watching California, particularly as it pertains to the climate change and how we implement this. So I think there's a lot of places where you can find your role. 
Uh, yes, uh, my name is Ping Chen. I'm with the uh, Southern California uh, Association of Governments. And uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity to attend and congratulations for the great effort as well as the, uh, the report. I just have a quick comment and also one question. The quick comment is it was mentioned earlier the sustainable community strategies under SB 375. And uh, even though as of today it has been viewed probably almost exclusively as a mitigation strategy uh, to meet the target. Uh, but uh, my personal uh, vision for that is that uh, it is also an excellent place to incorporate the adaptation strategy. And, and as the members pointed out, uh, and also I think we talked early, I think those two really are goes hand in hand. It's really an integral component of one holistic strategy. So, and uh, in Southern California, that we are actually scheduled to adopt the sustainable community strategy in the next 16 months. So, essentially, the strategy will be developed uh, within the next nine months. I think many of you have been participated uh, 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 in that. So, if you would like to participate in that, we will actually have the, the workshop throughout the region in the months of February and all the way till June, and to develop the first round. And admittedly, it, it, it most likely, it will be focusing most likely on mitigation, because as you can see, the adaptation, we are still building the foundation. And, and this is just a, an excellent start. And then my uh, question is that, in terms of recommendation of the co coordination among the major stakeholders, the public and private agencies, since we have many insightful minds, I think, on the panel, I would also like some of you probably just to comment on that. I work in the in regional planning that uh, for 15 years, uh, before I came back 10 years ago uh, in uh, Florida, it has the growth management legislation. So in there, I work with uh, the water district and uh, the school board, the environmental protection agency on a daily basis. And that is not the case in California. I think we all know California does not have the growth management legislation. Does not. The SB 375 is probably the uh, close to the beginning. I would not even say that is the beginning. So, and some of you I think have a lot more experience in public and private sector. So, uh, so this is just a one question I think of any of you could uh, provide some comment, I would really appreciate Thank you. All right, since uh, we, we have come to the end of our time here, uh, if anyone would like to uh, provide some brief uh, responses to this. <laughs> well, I, I will just simply ping you're on you're on target. That's why that's why the group has insisted on this, although we did not have a prescription. And it is very difficult in California, and, and it's easy to see, it's hard to deal with. Uh, I would just say, just anecdotally, uh, we had several conversations with people involved in, in AB, I mean, SB 375 planning as to whether or not our group should explicitly recommend that adaptation be insinuated into it as a requirement. And I will just give you very quickly the, the what happened was I was on many of those conversations, and the, the conversation always went along. We worked so hard to get SB 375 enacted, we're struggling so greatly right now to get it implemented, please don't lay on another requirement. So we get to the end of the conversation, and I would always ask the seemed to me obvious question. I would say, well, do you think we should include adaptation? The answer was, whomever I spoke to said, oh, absolutely. But it's very difficult to insinuate formally because of the structure we currently have. Ah, thank you very Thanks. much. Okay. I, I think the smart money, when they make investments, We'll incorporate adaptation, but our job is to educate people so that they can make those judgments. Okay, very good. Uh, very good. Well, I, uh, this is the uh, the end of our session. I, I want to thank uh, first uh, our associate dean, uh, Professor Giuliano, for her introduction, and our presenter, Professor Mazmanian, and of course our panelists for uh, an insightful and at times provocative. Uh, discussion, thanks to Lee in particular, uh, of this very important uh, issue. 
Uh, I also want to give special thanks to my wonderful graduate assistants, and especially Elena Maggioni, who handled the overall logistics for this program. The, the fact that we had breakfast, is, you owe to her and, and, and all of the uh, assistants. And also, of course, HSBC, our sponsor, for making this possible. And of course, for the audience, for your interest and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.